Hi, Leon. How are you? Okay. How are you? Good. Could you please spell your name for the... Leon, L-E-O-N, Goldman, G-O-L-D-M-A-N. Great. So we're going to talk about how you got involved in the business ethics and compliance business. Can you give us a little of your personal history? So the question being, how did I get involved and how did this all start? Um, I did not start out to be in business ethics. In fact, when I started, I had no idea what business ethics was. So I began uh, as a surgeon. And uh, I was a surgeon for 28 years doing general surgery at an academic medical center in Boston. Um, and it got a point in my career when um, I had seen other people slow down as they got older and some stayed too long and had, um, especially from my professor actually, who said uh, surgeons should not wait to be told that they can no longer do what they are doing. They should just decide to stop when they're at the top of their game. So I started to make plans to transition out of surgery to find something else to do. And I had done management courses and other things thinking that the only thing old doctors do is they transition into administration. Uh, and then one day I got called to the uh, CEO's office and was asked if I'd like to be the compliance officer for the medical center. Uh, for me, it was a chance to get out of surgery and I had no idea what they were talking about. But I said yes. Um, and in order to learn what that was, they sent me to a course being given by the Association of American Medical Colleges um, about compliance in healthcare. Uh, at this point, I didn't know why they asked me to do this or why they were doing this. I later came to learn it was because they were under federal sentencing agreement and they didn't have much choice. In any event, I, I went to the course and they uh, compliance officer or ethics officer from Raytheon was speaking. That was interesting. Uh, fine. Uh, I came back and I started to read and try and figure out, well, what am I going to do? And there were lawyers who were helping me saying, well, these are, our, these are things we have to do. And it was in research that they were under an agreement. This was back in 1999, which was a few years after the physicians at Teaching Hospital uh, investigations had been undertaken. And I was still trying to figure out what to do and then I finally said to myself at that time, and I still do, I live in Lexington, and Raytheon was located, its, its headquarters were in Lexington. So what have I got to lose? I made a phone call to Raytheon and asked to speak to their compliance department, I had the name of the person who spoke, and I asked if they would talk to me. And to my surprise, they said yes. So I went over there and spent an hour with Patty Ellis, and, who then proceeded to say, well, here are videos for training, and these are our documents, and anything else you want. And it was actually through Patty that I found my way to the um, Center for Business Ethics and Mike Hoffman. And that began this very long relationship for me with the Center for Business Ethics and the beginning of my understanding of really the issues of business ethics. And the more I did what I did, so I became the compliance officer, both research and healthcare. Then in 2003 became also the privacy officer. But my reading and most of my interest became really why do good people do bad things? And what are the structural issues about organizations that either enable good people to do good things or enable bad people to do bad things or inhibit bad people from doing bad things? And that's been not a research focus, but a focus that I continue to try and understand what is there about human behavior that really, I mean, if you look, I'm not aware of any business or healthcare facility that hasn't had some problem with the federal government. And usually it's multiple small things or some occasional really bad people, but most of them are good people who have various uh, pressures on them and end up doing something, you know, I won't get caught, I need to do it, I'll lose my job. Uh, for me, also, what are the unintended uh, consequences of policies and 
again, early in my career, was reading about um, Sears and the Sears Automotive Stores and how their managers ended up causing Sears to get in trouble when you traced it back. There was nothing wrong with managers. They were just trying to survive. It was the quota system that had been put in place, and nobody thought about the bad things that come. Quotas are good, makes people do things. That's nice. But if you're fearful for your job, you may try and fudge your quota to make sure you meet it. So that's how I got into it and then have continued in it with that interest. So uh, did you spend your career at one place or did you go to others? I spent my entire medical career in compliance, well, my medical career uh, at one place. At I, one and that was at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, or what was the Beth Israel Hospital before the merger with Deaconess, and that's... We can go into that learning experience. Um, and then I retired from there. And then I didn't really want to completely retire, so uh, everybody becomes a consultant. But that I realized I am not a business person. I can't sell myself. I don't do well. Being a consultant didn't work. But I had met some people and actually... The, it was a CEO of a startup company who had been a cardiac fellow w at the hospital when I was there, and he knew me. And he had actually contacted me before I retired from medical center because they had compliance software they were working on. Um, and then about a year after I retired, he approached me about becoming their medical director. Uh, which was intriguing because I'd never been in a for-profit startup company in my life. I had no idea what I was in for. It was a fascinating experience about how that differs from the nonprofit world I had been in. Uh, and I worked for them for about four years, also helping them with startups really don't have compliance, but he and I would have conversations about organizational values. How do you implement them? How do you make even 25 people aware of them? And how do you make sure we're all on the same page? Um, What's the answer? For a small company like that, it really depends on what the leadership does and the CEO. And there were one or two small events that happened which made very clear what the standards of this organization were by the way he took on the challenges, especially around privacy, because now they were dealing with patient data. Um, and rather than sweep small things under the rug, they were all attacked head-on, customers were notified, um, and making very clear that they will uh, not bypass the rules or, or play games. So I think for a startup, there has to be a commitment. First has to be the leadership, and they have to live their, live their values, when they have to be consistent. At some point, they do need to write them down. Even small startups begin it was interesting to watch this company evolve from five people to a hundred people and the, and the change in what was needed to coordinate and make sure everybody knew what the values were. There were assumptions that were made that they learned. You can't just assume you have to start stating them and write them down somewhere and make them real. So you've used the term values, ethics, compliance, business ethics. Do you have a favorite term? And if so, what is it and why? So what is my favorite term out of all the ones that you hear about compliance, business ethics, values? Um, I'm not sure I have a favorite term. Part of the dilemma for the business ethics community is the multiplicity of terms and the multiplicity of meanings for each term. Um, I, the fellows in October got together, some of them, to have a discussion before Mike passed away in 2018. Um, he had organized a symposium and talk about, from the perspective of practicing compliance of business ethics persons, practitioners, uh, what does it mean to have an ethical culture? Uh, what are the barriers? What are the ways you do it? And one of the things that they talked about um, is one should never really be looking for an ethical culture per se. 
one should look at an organization's culture and ask the question, is it ethical? Uh, the culture is what it is. The question is, is it ethical? And if not, why not? And if it is, what makes it ethical? Uh, and then we got into questions more about consistency, about statements and actions. That uh, whether you call them values or mission or whatever, is really what the public and what the employees see are the consistency between what everybody says and what happens. So Enron is the great example people call upon. Uh, maybe they beat it to death, but maybe not. But here you have a great, you know, everybody has the picture of the uh, Code of Conduct, this wonderful book about all the wonderful things they believe in. And every employee knew that's not the way they practiced. Or um, a Wells Fargo or any of the companies. What causes the trouble is when suddenly it becomes apparent that here are the public statements and here's what actually goes on. And they don't really match. People will allow for some mismatch. But dramatic mismatches um, are a problem because people will, people learn what they need to do to survive in a company. And they do what they need to do. And if that's not, uh, if that's not what some people would call ethical or right, these aren't people who go home and cheat and steal necessarily. Uh, they're good people. They may attend whatever religious affiliation or whatever and, and think of themselves as good people. Um, but they can separate themselves to do what they need to do to survive. Um, this is human. Um, there's the movie, um, I forget the name, it's about a child in a concentration camp who would play with the commandant's son. And the commandant loved his children, cared for them, was warm and tender and had no problem massacring others. The ability to separate, to um, see what they have to do, whether it's because they feel their life is on the line or their job is on their line or their family's livelihood's on the line. And that, um, That to me yeah, often is the major problem. And leadership, in the end, it comes down to looking and seeing what the leaders are doing. So let's go back and talk about your very <coughs> early years in this role yes. at Beth Israel. So you're given this role, you weren't really expecting it. What did you, after you did your research and your benchmarking and met with Patty Ellis? Uh, what, what is it that you wanted to accomplish? Did you accomplish that? And how did you go about making that happen at Beth Israel? So what is it I wanted to accomplish when I started out? How did I go about doing it? And did I get there? What I, the first and basic, you know, is my role was to try and keep the organization out of trouble. That being said, I needed to develop a program which would satisfy the guidelines if we were assessed. At the same time, a big challenge for me was trying to overcome. We have a compliance program. It's, it's working on the settlement agreement. And that's in, that's in that corner. It has nothing to do with everything else we do. Uh, and the... Uh, the aspect was my trying to maintain and tell people um, that it was a more pervasive uh, issue. Um, so, for example, my story of being stopped by one of the board members once who asked me how my compliance program was going. And I looked at them and said, it's not my compliance program, it's yours. I just happen to be in charge of it right now. Um, and that I had learned from Michael and Patty. <laughs> That's, I was able to give that response. And then I tried to function that way, trying to show the physicians and others that my job is to administer a program whose goal is to try and make their lives better so they don't have to think about 
what the rules are. They can do what they need to do and know that through the program's efforts, they are within the boundaries that they need to be. This was especially true for researchers. Uh, you know, one of the big uh, challenges for healthcare early on became the whole issue of gifting. And that became a big bugaboo for healthcare, and a lot of outsiders were saying physicians take too many gifts, uh, they get bought off. Now, everybody who gets a gift will tell you it doesn't affect my choices. I set that aside and I still only choose for the patients or for the public if you're a pol politician or whatever. And I felt that way too. Having been for, One of the things that I brought to the job was I was what they are. I was a physician, I met with drug companies, I was taken on trips, um, and I believed they didn't affect me until I thought back on some of the things I chose to do. Um, and it was helping people or trying to convince people uh, the whole notion of gifting is reciprocity. Um, and I went through this whole discussion with them, whether they heard or not is a different story. Uh, so much of my time as I was there was trying to develop um, and look at the institution about what are the rules and, and, and uh, structures within the organization and how do they either aid in what we're trying to do or hinder what we're trying to do. At the same time, so did I, did I accomplish it? Uh, a little. What were the barriers that you I mean, the, the barriers um, were, one, they went through a merger and went through six CEOs in about three years. So your leadership kept changing. Uh, the board evolved as time went on, but boards at nonprofit healthcare institutions are collections of big donors. The... Uh, management really doesn't want them involved in running anything. And the board evolved as more people, as, as compliance became bigger in the news, and the board saw more and more of what happened in other institutions, and their need that they would be held liable, they began to evolve into a more of a, ma a board that at least did what boards are supposed to do, and had oversight. Uh, the other barriers are reported to the general counsel. Not necessarily a bad thing, but early on the general counsel's view of, compli of compliance was that um, when you get in trouble, call a lawyer. But he didn't quite understand what compliance officers were for. We, we developed a relationship. It worked. I think I was tolerated more than anything else. So should ethics compliance officers report to GCs? Or no. Not? Absolutely, unequivocally, never. I have no doubt about that. I think that they need to work with the GC. I mean, the other problem I had is I was never on the senior management uh, committee or whatever. I was an afterthought that would be called in once in a while, but I didn't participate until near the end when they started getting in trouble again. Um, I think that compliance officers, ethics officers, business conduct, whatever you want to call people, their role is very different than the GC. They're interlocked, but they're very different. I don't think compliance officers should be lawyers. And if they're lawyers, they should forget that they're lawyers afterwards when they take the job. And that's something even Pat Nazzo, who's one of the fellows here at the center, and was a lawyer when he first became a compliance officer, talks about a lot. Um, they're very different roles. And also how the senior management relates to compliance says something to the rest of the company. And if my role as often was the challenge was seen as mostly downstream, I mean, my 
repeated question to the compliance officers at the center and to Mike, for which I got no good answer, was how do you lead up? How do you go up and get their attention? So you would say that's a continuing challenge? That's a continuing challenge, leading up. My sense right now, um, maybe I'm jaded, um, is there are CEOs who understand, and it's just part of who they are, they believe in it, and they, they embrace the business ethics function. There are CEOs who see the business ethics as just there, something they have to do, and they really don't want to be bothered because they're ethical. I mean, one of the challenges also within a, non within a nonprofit, yeah, actually, any nonprofit, whether it be a charity, university, is we only hire ethical people. We're all ethical. What do we need you for? You're not going to tell us how to behave. And my answer is, no, I'm not. But I am going to look at the structures and other things that may get in the way of people doing what they would like to do, and that's to do the right thing. Leon, talk to us a little bit about something that you did in your career either at the startup or at Beth Israel to help address that problem? What structures did you change? What did you identify that was an impediment to ethical behavior? I can't, so trying to think of what did I do, what structure did I put in place, or um, I don't, I wouldn't take credit for putting something in place. But what did I do? So the first thing I did uh, early on was to become a member of the ethics committee at the hospital. I was a committee of physicians and nurses addressing ethical issues. And I put myself on that committee. Well, I actually knew the chair. and We talked and I got on the committee and would be a participant in every meeting. That also then got me into the um, Harvard Medical School um, ethics committee, which all the other hospitals. And I would raise, at least at the Beth Israel Deaconess's uh, ethics committee, uh, structural business issues as ethical challenges where they would talk about patient rights, patient autonomy. I would ask the question, well, how does gifting affect patients and shouldn't we, the ethics committee, be talking about that? Um, and slowly got them to address some of those issues and become a participant in them. So we would make ethics rounds in the intensive care unit, talk about a patient, and also uncover structural issues in the unit as far as how many people may be on call or whatever. And then would take those back to the administration as ethical issues, not just talk about the patient, one patient issue per se. I did try and bring together all of the compliance officers and all the ethics chairs from all of the Harvard Medical School hospitals together at a retreat. How'd that go? Um, the day went well. Uh, everybody said they thanked me, uh, but nobody wanted to repeat it. They saw no reason to have a regular meeting where they would get together and talk to each other since they didn't have anything to do with each other. And so that was frustrating. Does um, that remain a challenge in medicine? Yes. Medicine views ethics as uh, medical, medical ethics and compliance has become much more legal. And one of the challenges I see for the future is that it's seen as a much more legal event. More and more lawyers are entering it, and more and more rules are being made. And the world is becoming one of employees saying, just tell me what to do. There's a rule about it. Do I do it or not do it? I don't want to think about it. I don't want to. Enough of this moral dimension and ethical reasoning. Don't care. Just tell me what to do. So um, you were the because they see themselves as I think you're right. They see themselves as healthcare professionals, that these ethical issues are a sideline. This is being done because of settlement agreements. Um, and many of the rules that the government had in place 
were a little strange from the point of view of healthcare providers. Um, so one of the big examples while I was, I don't know if it still is, but was this whole issue of admission versus outpatient treatment because the government pays at very different rates. And so if somebody is, the rules came down that if somebody is admitted for, you know, rule out appendicitis, they have abdominal pain, question appendicitis, bring them in to be observed. The government started going towards the direction of saying, well, you can admit them, but that's an outpatient treatment. They're not inpatients, and we're going to pay differently. Because 24 hours later, or 10 hours later, you may say, you don't have appendicitis, go home. From a clinician's point of view, they don't think that way. They're in the hospital, and I'm watching them. What do I care? Call it what you want. I don't want to know about it. But the physicians were told, you have to document it as an inpatient or outpatient. And that became a major challenge. Uh, and one that I don't think was ever really solved. Um, and it makes no sense from a clinical point of view. So that was a, not an ethical issue, that was a compliance issue, compliance with the government rules on... Class. Right, but then, but then it's an ethical issue in as much if you're not compliant with the government rules, you're cheating the government. Now that may not be an intent and not what anyone thinks about, but I think there is an ethical dimension to the institution figuring out how do we solve the dilemma. And it's a dilemma that's very difficult to solve. Um, the, the same was in getting people, you know, doctor, can't you just write that it's okay for me to get a ride here with the ride? I can't take the, the, MB, the transit. It's hard on me. Well, you're not disabled. And yeah, but just write it down that way. And a lot of people would do that at times or would order some sort of therapy. That's fraud from the government's point of view. And so getting people to understand they have to say no to a patient who probably does have a real need and is very sympathetic, but you can't do it, and getting people to do that. Um, helping people understand when you say no to a gift from a drug rep, you know, the view was a very unethical drug rep. Actually, no. The rep is being ethical in as much as they're doing everything they're supposed to do in their job, under their job description, as defined by their company. You, physician, say no. What's the problem? Well, part of it, the reality is they don't want to say no, and it's appealing. Um, now, there are a whole constellation of things about drug companies and how they marketed and the stories that they would go to colleges to recruit new drug reps from the cheerleader squads of the sports for very clear reasons. Um, so those are all kinds of discussions we can get into. Um, and it's a bit, to me, it all comes down to human behavior, marketing. I mean, at what point is marketing lying? At what point is marketing just educating? Talk to the company marketers. We're educating. Uh, yeah, much of the time. But is your marketing totally truthful? Um, uh, I just think. The challenge for, often for the leader of the business conduct organization within the group is highlighting things and reminding people, not just what the rules are. Uh, and so that's why watching some of the videos that some of the larger organizations can afford to do about showing dilemmas and then having a conversation. How do you solve the dilemma? What would you do? Get in with a group of uh, employees and saying, how would you do this? How would you do this? There aren't necessarily right answers. Again, I'm reminded of talking to someone in the defense industry when they were talking about what's a nominal gift because that was a big discussion at that point in my life with the physicians. What's nominal? A hundred dollars. Yeah, well, maybe because your income is high, a hundred's nominal. But if you go talk to the housekeeping staff, that's a lot of money. Um, or all I got was tickets to the Celtics game. 
on the floor in the finals? I don't think that's a hundred bucks, guys. Um, and so talking to one of the defense people, I said, I how do you talk about bribe? Because in reality, you also have to get your stuff through the port. And he says, what he tells his people is if the, the um, officer or whoever it is in the small country that you're trying to import, if you can give him what he's looking for because you carry it in your pocket, probably okay. Not great, but okay. If you have to call back to the company to get a check cut, no, nah, you've just been bribed. Or, uh, you know, how much is a gift that you can take? Okay, if you take a gift from a rep to your company and you're going to put it on your secretary's desk so everybody sees it, that's a nominal gift. If your first reaction is take the gift, run to the car, open the trunk, put the car in, and close it, you probably shouldn't be taking that. That's not right. Um, it's real practical advice. So it's real practical advice. I think that's one of the jobs in the practical aspect. And the business ethics literature is interesting. Sometimes it's too philosophical or obtuse for me, but, but much of it sometimes can't easily be translated into daily life. And so a lot of things, um, again, that the, um, as the common fellows, uh, fellows talk about is some of these, you know, asking each other these practical things. What do I do? How, how did you solve this in your company? And, um, I mean, again, I, I know it's, well, yeah, I'll say it. Early on, one of the things Patty Ellis did is she said, would you like me to arrange for your CEO to talk to our CEO? So my reaction is, you've just said that your CEO of a $25 billion multinational corporation would be willing to sit down with my CEO of a small healthcare service in one city. Sounds pretty good to me about, you know, the importance of compliance. I went back and told my CEO, would you like to arrange it so you can learn about compliance? He said, no, I don't think I have to. It's not necessary. And that, early on, someone gave me a message about, okay, here's your struggle. And I would fight that once in a while. And otherwise, I'd do what I needed to do with the researchers, with the physicians. Um, one of the advantages for me in having been a physician at the hospital for 28 years and knowing everybody was the ability when a physician started to say, well, this is important, this is patient care, this is, you know, to say, you know, bullshit. Come on, you know, don't give me that. Now let's talk. These are the things you should do. The law says you have to. I know it's, I know it's annoying. I know it bothers you. Let me give you a hint about how to do it so it's easy. Short way to phrase it, maybe. So real practical advice in the end that will help people change their behavior yes. in certain ways. Yes. It's really about finding practical solution. All the employees, physicians, whatever it is, just make my life easier. I have a tough job. I'm running around. I just want to make my life easier. I know you have things to do. And I think that the compliance's job is to go anywhere in the organization, any organization, say, what is it I can do to make your life easier and help you comply? So as you reflect back on your years as a physician, as a compliance person, and now that you've had a little distance from that, would you say there's been progress over time? Are things different today? I think there's, is there progress, the question being, is there progress over the years as I look back? There's, there's some progress and there's not progress. There's progress in it becoming more of a profession. People are realizing what's necessary. At the same time, uh, that progress has included becoming much more um, rules-based and rigid. And it's lost some of its ability to really uh, touch base with academia and what's going on in other areas. Uh, I think there's not progress when you look at, for example, what grew early was the Healthcare Compliance Association, and that was just about healthcare. And one of my issues has always been, you know, there's ethics. There's ethics in the context of business. There's ethics in the context of medicine. There's ethics in the context of defense industry. There's not business ethics. There's not medical ethics. There's ethics in the context of, and you 
all can learn from each other. Now, uh, a number of years ago, the whoever owned the Healthcare Compliance Association also joined with the uh, Society for Compliance, the SCCE. They're still separate societies. I've asked when, you know, their former CEO, why? Never got an answer, and I still ask, why? Why don't you have a business or a compliance uh, group that brings everybody together to learn from each other? One of the greatest things for me was taking the management in S MEO course, Managing Ethics in Organizations, and to meet people from Caterpillar, from the banks, from foreign countries, and ask them the same questions that I was struggling with, and hear how they did it. These challenges, you know, how do you deal with gifting? Well, gifting is a healthcare problem? No. Gifting is a problem in every industry. Um, I kept asking just because I like to ask the question to my lawyer friends. As a physician, it's illegal for me to get referral payments. Why isn't it illegal for you? Um, I'm sure that created great conversations. Oh, yeah, a great conversations. Are the conversations Michael Coffin and I used to have? Michael, I have a compliance program in a hospital because I have to. How come there's no compliance program in a university, even though you're centered here as a center? And these questions still remain today. And they still remain, although some many universities, I think, today now do have ethics or compliance programs. But it took them a while to get there. And yet, if you, as a business school, had a center for it and were teaching it, how come you didn't have one? An excellent question. And I think that's human nature. We tend to be blind. And we don't have a problem. Leon, we are reaching the end of our time together. Yes, so thank I'm you. Wondering what did you come here to say that you have not yet had the chance to say? What do you want to share before we bring this to a close? I would share that I think it's a great profession. I think people should do it. Um, it's a chance to learn, but I think people also who are doing it need to find some business school or academic institution in which to partner with and to start to exchange ideas. Um, I think that practitioners bring a reality and academia brings an understanding. And it's, it's like even compliance processes across industries. You need to talk to each other. We really need to do a lot more talking with each other about what our challenges are and what ideas we have for solutions. At various points in this interview, you've mentioned Mike Hoffman, Bentley, and the Common Fellows, but we haven't really strung that all together for uh, so Mike Hoffman was the director for the Center of Business Ethics and began the whole concept of business ethics. He was a philosopher and became noted historically over the years for his work in business ethics. Mike passed away um, this past year. He had the Center for Business Ethics, which then became the Hoffman Center for Business Ethics. And within it, uh, many, many years ago, he established the Kalman uh, Fellows. These are senior business ethics practitioners who are fellows within the center who meet regularly and act um, as advisors to the center when asked and also can be invited by the faculty to teach a class or to meet with students. They're available. Um, they are you know, Raytheon, Verizon, uh, major companies banks, financial organizations. They represent various industries and they represent experienced people who have spent many, many years thinking about and doing uh, business ethics within the business world. What kind of man was Mike Hoffman? What was his philosophy to make him the right man? Michael was a press of philosophy and actually came here early. Um, and I think just found business ethics interesting and then got into it more and more. Um, and he was the driving force for all of the fellows. He did not only, and he bridged the philosophical gap in as much as he also did consulting in business ethics and did it with a lot of the early organizations. And it was actually through him, he began with some people, the ethics officer organization, which then went on to become 
the Ethics and Compliance Officer Organization, and then got merged in with the Ethics Compliance Initiative most recently. Um, but he is, many people consider, the father of the business ethics movement uh, throughout the United States and was a quiet-spoken but very, very forceful man. <laughs> Pat, did you have any questions? No, I think so, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the time.